So thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Leib Moshe, for thinking about me. Um, first things first, I just want to say, and we, we have to always remember this, we're in Yerushalayim in 2023, I think it is, 2,000 years after the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed. If you would have asked our great-grandparents, would we be here right now? Would we even be alive? You asked my grandfather when he went in the camps at 13 years old, and he saw his father killed, and he saw his mother killed, and he saw his brothers and sisters killed. Do you think that your grandson's going to do tshuva, become a religious Orthodox Jew who calls himself a breast lover chassid, and makes aliyah to Eretz Yisrael and teaches in Yerushalayim? You know, what would you think? So, like Lev Moshe was saying, we get very um, tunnel visioned on the problems, and that's the nature of a person. Rabbi Nachman says it's the nature of a person to be sad. He also says that the hardest midrega to obtain is to be happy. So it's an effort, it's a choice, and you have to constantly put everything you have into that effort. That's the fight Rabbi Nachman says between Yaakov and Esav. It's really the fight between joy and sadness. And we learn from the Gemara that you have to be proactive in fighting the Yitzhahara. It's not enough to like, he knocks you on the ground and you're waiting for it and then finally when you have nothing left, you give it whatever you have. Obviously, if you're in that situation, that's what you should do. But the Gemara is saying good advice. No, you have to actively fight for joy. You have to fight for the right to party. That was Jews, no? <laughs> Beastie Boys, they were Jewish, okay. Everyone has their own spark and it reveals itself in different ways. But they were a little breast lovers, you know? Like, the, you have to fight for the right to be happy. It's not just going to come to you. It's not your nature. And we all know that that's why we're all sitting here together. So first of all, Ashreino, we're so lucky to be here. And even just personally, as a person who always felt like an outsider and a stranger, and no matter what my group of friends was growing up, whether it was the cool kids at one point, and then I was outcasted, and then it was the hippies and the stoners, and then I was outcasted, I never really felt home until I got to Uman. And uh, that's an amazing experience after 30 years to never know if you're ever going to fit in anywhere, you're ever going to feel like yourself, you're ever going to feel, am I real? Is this real? Am I weird? Am I different? And maybe I am, but how come nobody else is? And then all of a sudden you just see a lot of people who are very genuine and honest and uh, looking for the truth and humbled by life and lifted up by the tzaddik and then we can connect. And so this is an amazing experience. We're very lucky to be together as friends. I'm sure the Rebbe would be very proud and is very proud and happy of, uh, with us that we're here together. You know, Rebbe Nachman says in the 64th, six, sorry, 65th Torah of the Kutmaran, the famous Balasada, master of the field, something that we, we lose track of, I think. We all know about the, the great master of the field, but we lose that second part where he says that everything that we do to do the Ratzon of Hashem. And really, what is the Ratzon of Hashem? It's all the Eitzes of the Tzaddik. The more that we can bring those into our life, the more Koach we're giving to the Tzaddik to fight for us, to help us, and to tend to us in the field like we so need. And we're doing that by getting together as friends. And um, this is the beautiful thing, you know, nobody has to figure out, you know, who's gonna be the next Rebbe? Is it gonna be Lev Moshe? Is it gonna be me? Is it gonna be you? Like, once you know you don't have to be, you're free. You could just be you. Hashem loves you just like you. Rebbeinu loves you just like you. And we could just be ourselves and do that together. And that's the most amazing thing. And that's really what everybody needs. I heard uh, once Shlomo Karlobach say that Moshe Rebbeinu was the greatest teacher. And King David was the greatest king. And Mashiach will be the best friend. And I don't know exactly what that means, and I'm sure it's much deeper than it sounds, but on a simple level, I think it means like maybe just to be a, a good friend is a, is a very big devote in our generation right now. And we can all feel that, like that's much what we need. Um, I was thinking as Rav Limosh was talking about how it's not normal to be happy in the outside world, and really the most normal thing is to be happy. You know, if you think about kids, if you see kids, if you have kids, Bezrat Hashem one day, you see their natural state is happy. Unless you mess it up by bringing home all your <laughs> stuff and you're fighting with your wife and, you know, we all grew up like that. 
but naturally the kids are happy. Why are they not? Why are they happy? Because they're not worried. Why are they not worried? Because they believe everything's going to be okay. Rebbeinu is coming to say, let's get back to that. There's a story of the Baal Shem Tov, and one of his chassidim said to him, why is it that everybody thinks we're crazy? Seems pretty pertinent based on what we're talking about. Why does everybody think we're crazy? And the Baal Shem Tov said back to them, I'll tell you a story. Once, there was a person, he was walking through the woods, and all of a sudden, he sees out of nowhere a group of people dancing. Like, really into it. Real hippies. And they see a guy who's leading their dancing. Some, like some type of cult leader. Moving his hands, going like this. They're all doing backflips and twirling together and doing it. And this guy's like, oh my gosh, these guys are insane. And the Baal Shem Tov explained, why did he think that they were crazy? Because he was deaf. So because he couldn't hear, he didn't understand what they were doing. But if you can hear the music, if you know the music, if you sense the music, you can taste it and touch it and it's real for you, it's, you're familiar with that song. So then you're able, to, um, you're able to join the joy. You're able to gather together and to be a part of this joy together. And it's not crazy anymore. Rabbi Nachman says that at the end of days, there's going to be a new song. A single, double, triple, quadruple, who knows what he's talking about type of song. It's based on very deep Kabbalah, based on the expansions of Hashem's name. Ben and Ma, Sag and Av, for anybody who likes that stuff and does this on their off time, but it's a very deep thing. But it's definitely a, it's definitely a song of simcha. It's definitely a song of joy. And Bo Hashem, we're familiar with that song. And therefore, you know, it's not crazy for us anymore. It's a very hard time people are going through right now. You know, I, I saw somebody put out a shiur you know, I, I made Aliyah, and now I'm in the middle of a war. <laughs> you know, something like that. For me, not that I anticipated a war, but I anticipated some type of war, because the Pasuk says, Shchan Eretz Urei Emuna, dwell in the land and cultivate faith. Why you come to the land of Israel? So you can develop faith. Rabbi Nachman says, what is faith? Faith is not understanding. Something very simple. It's not a very deep thing. It's a very simple thing. What does it mean to believe? It means that you believe that which you don't understand. What puts you in a circumstance or a situation that you're not going to understand what's happening? It sounds like it's probably going to be difficult. Because if it was easy, that means you understand it. Because Rabbi Nachman says that if you have da'at, you're going to be happy. If you lack da'at, it's going to make you frustrated. So really, it's about understanding. So comes Rabbi Nachman to say, the greatest mile is Amuna. And the place to develop that Amuna is in the land of Israel. So what do you expect when you come to the land of Israel? You should expect Milchama. Rabbi Nachman has a story where he speaks about there's this king, he gives this kingship over to his son. And he told his son, listen, I'm giving you the kingship in my lifetime, which is an amazing thing. This kingship that I'm giving you, I can tell because I could see in the stars that you're going to lose this kingship says, when you lose this kingship, if you remain happy, I'll be very happy. And if you're not happy when you lose it, I'll still be happy because I'll know you shouldn't have never been the king. This boy becomes the king. And he has a little bit of a niche infatuation. And everybody likes their thing. Somebody likes sports, somebody likes cars, everyone's got their own thing. The boy has a little thing. He's really into chokhmah. He's really into wisdom. Right? He's infatuated with learning things. So what does a person do who's infatuated with something? He surrounds himself by it. Right? Who are your friends growing up? The ones who had the same interests as you. You had the jocks, and you had the stoners, and you had the popular kids. Right? What is all based around? What's your interest? So his interest is wisdom. He happens to be the leader of the entire nation. So what do you think he surrounds himself with? Very wise people. And all of a sudden, the society is obsessed with wisdom. And Rabbi Nachman, in his normal, prescient way, he starts explaining. So they start going after <coughs> higher education. And all of a sudden, this higher education brings them to atheism. And then they come to the king. 
who's now the, right, the son of the king, who's now the king. And they said to him, listen, you know, this whole wisdom that you're into, we're into it also. And I took, we took it all the way. And guess what's at the end of the tunnel? There's no God. And the king's son's like, Psh, that makes sense. You're right. And then when they leave, he starts to feel weird about it. He's like, do I really not believe? And then all of a sudden he goes back when they start speaking to him again. This goes on and off and on and off. And then Rabbi Nachman says something that's like very, um, I don't know what the word is. It's like very harrowing when you think about it. He said that they were learning Chochmah. But they forgot the art of war. Comes Rabbi Nachman to tell you, and if you learn the Kutumran, I mean, a person who doesn't know, who's never seen it, would think like, okay, I even once heard a rabbi say that this, I'm, we're not going to say who it is, but uh, I like wanted to vomit. <laughs> he told this guy, he's the head of the yeshiva, and they're all listening to him and imbibing this person's words. And uh, someone's asking about Breslov, and he goes, yeah, Breslov's good, Breslov, but with Das. And uh, I just didn't understand what he was talking about. I was like, did you ever see Lakut Moran? How Rabbi Nachman is just rattling off sources from all across the context of Torah, Tanakh, the Oral Torah, Zohar, Kabbalah, everything. Musr, everything, everything. You can't look at one Torah in there and say there's no Dad. If, it, if there's anything in Breslov, it's Dad. And yet he says the most important thing for you to do is to throw your da'at to the side. This bala da'at is telling you, you know why your life went off the... And you know why the Jewish people are off the... Because they're busy chasing after understanding. But they forgot how to fight. We're here in this world to fight. I'm going to give you an example of what it looks like to fight. Because I don't want you to think now we're all going to join the karate class tomorrow and like... I'm like, I'm going to encourage you guys to get guns. This is not what I came here for, okay? Teach you how to fight the way that the Rebbe taught us how to fight. There was a Rebbe, his name was the Klausenberger Rebbe. He was a great tzaddik. He was in the Shoah. He also lost his whole family there. When he first got there, he was hated amongst everybody who was near him because he was very strong in his values and he wouldn't budge on anything. And even things that halakhically you would say, okay, you don't have to be so makbid right now because your life's on the line. He was still makbid. For instance, they gave him food that wasn't kosher. Now, most people know that if your life is on the line, it's actually a mitzvah to have that non-kosher food. However, when you're one of the greatest tzaddikim in the generation, you might rather die. So he said, no, I'm not going to have it. And it got everybody in trouble near him. And so it was like a whole balagan. They're like, this guy, you know, like this freaking guy. We don't have any food. We don't have any drink. And this guy, you know, they don't know him. There's a lot of secular people there. There's a lot of people who are just not familiar with Hasidus. And so there's not this reverence for the Rebbe. They don't know the Klosenberg Rebbe. But as time goes on and a person doesn't budge from, and this is good for us also, you don't move from your place no matter what. So then after a while, you start to develop respect for that person. And then even develop a reverence for that person. And as the years went on, he became like the Rebbe of the camp. Everybody who was there, Ashkenazi, if you were Hasidic, if you were secular, it didn't make a difference. Everyone went to the Rebbe for advice, for help, encouragement, whatever. And whatever he said at this point, we're Moskim. They went on something called a death march, which is they take you from one camp to another. When they take you from one camp to another, it's not like an easy transport. It's not even like the bus on the way from uh, wherever you got dropped off on the way to Uman. It's, it's uh, which we thought might have been like a death march. But <laughs> not quite, okay? They didn't give them food to eat. They didn't give them drinks to drink. They beat them on the way. Most of the people, I would say over half the people in every one of these death marches, they died along the way. They never got to the next camp, okay? This is happening to the Klosenberg Rebbe and to the people who are with him. And the Germans, it doesn't look like they're going to give them any rest. They hadn't given them food to eat for days. Drinks to drink for days. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the Germans said, we're going to stop. We're going to rest. I guess they needed rest. So all of a sudden, they all go to lie down. And there are these Jewish people there that are shriveled up like bones, have not eaten in days. Their tongues were literally sticking to the side of their mouths. 
Because that's what happens when you don't eat and drink for days and you're that dehydrated. They couldn't even move their mouths to speak because of how uh, serious and acute the situation was. All of a sudden, they all just dropped to the ground when they realized that the Germans were really giving them time to light rest. As soon as they all went to the ground, the Klausenberger Rebbe spoke, and he never speaks unless he needs to speak. And he says to everybody, start digging. And nobody had any idea what he was talking about. And he's looking at them with those eyes, the eyes of a tzaddik, that you know he means what he says, and you don't know why he's saying what he's saying. But, okay, they start digging. And they have no strength. So they're taking their fingernails, and they're trying to get the little bit of dirt that's underneath them, and they're all digging. Half an hour, an hour, hour and a half, two hours. After a few hours, finally, they got a few inches within the ground. And out of nowhere, water shot up from the ground, like a geyser. And everyone there, despite not having eaten for days, despite not having drinking, beside the fact that it looks like, like they're dead, even though they're alive, they all start dancing. Secular, religious, doesn't matter. Everyone there is dancing. I, the Germans, are going to wake up and kill. They don't care. They tasted a Muna. They tasted what it is to be connected to a Tzaddik. They saw somehow this nace happened and there's water coming up from the ground. The Germans came over. They were so dumbfounded. They were mad at each other. They didn't do anything to them. They drank from the water. They moved on their way. They went to the other camp. After everything was done and the Klausenberg Rebbe survived, so they interviewed him. And they said, we heard this story about this thing that happened in this place. Can you tell us, how did you know that there was water under there? You know, were you studying maps before the show was started? You know, like, how could you be so... The Klausenberg Rebbe said, huh? What do you mean? He said, they said, how did you know there was water under the ground? He said, huh, what do you mean? He goes, how did you know there was water? We want to, how did you know? You were so sure you told them they were dead. They could have just lied down and finally slept. And you said, no, you can't sleep right now. Start to dig. And he said, I didn't know there was water under there. But the Gemara says that Yeshua can come in one moment. And I said, why not now? Rabbi Nachman says in the seventh lesson of Luke Zimran, that's a Muna. The Muna is to believe that Hashem is Mechadish. It's not enough to believe that God exists. Muslims also believe God exists. Christians also believe God exists. What is Jewish belief in God? That Hashem is Mechadish. Why are we starting the Torah with Bereshit? Why don't you start with a mitzvah? Because not a Muna to believe in the mitzvah. You have to believe that Hashem is Mechadish. That Hashem renews reality at every given moment and He chooses what He wants whenever He wants. That's belief in Hashem. That's a Muna. And that's what we need to fight. And Rabbi Nachman says, this Amuna is not just for the tzaddikim. I'm going to teach you this Amuna. I'm going to give you this Amuna. You follow my Eitzes, you live with my advice, you learn my Torahs, I'm going to give you this type of Amuna. And you're going to be able to believe the Emet, that Hashem is Mechadish. Now a person might say to himself, but David, I feel so broken. You know, right now we're all having a good time. We're enjoying each other. We're drinking beers. This is Gishma Gavaldik. But you don't know what it's like when I go back home. I'm really broken. I'm very far from this Amuna that you're talking about. I don't even know what to do with it. Okay. So we know that there are six Sedarim in Mishnayot. The first Seder is called Zroim, which means seed or sowing. The Gemara says, why is it called sowing? It's the, it's the Mishnah, it's the Seder of Amuna. it says. The whole thing is about faith. So Pash Pshat is, you need faith to be a farmer, right? Because it doesn't happen immediately. It's not like when we go on our iPhone and, you know, I have a gambling addiction and all of a sudden I just in one moment decide to splurge all the cash that I don't have, right? And you can do that in one moment. So that's not Amuna. What's Amuna? Amuna is... I have no idea what the elements are going to be this year. I have no idea who's going to come into the country. And I have to fight for this land. I'm going to put the time in and I'm going to spend the time harvesting this wheat and doing all the 15 steps that the Gemara says to get the bread. It takes a tremendous amount of amuna to do that. But I think it's deeper than that. 
Rav Natan says in Lekut HaLachot, how does something grow? You put a seed in the ground, and Bo Hashem, this is one of the benefits of science, is that if you look at a seed through a microscope, what actually happens to the seed in the ground is it decomposes. It dies. And at the moment that the seed dies, at that very moment, the plant shoots up from the ground. Mashiach is called Semach. It's one of the names of Mashiach. Which means he sprouts. What does it mean he sprouts? It means he's coming from something that looks like it's dying. And when a woman is giving birth, if you were an alien and you were watching from the outside, what do you see? You're coming in and all of a sudden you see a person sitting there. You know, I'm not going to get too graphic, but there's a lot of blood. People look very nervous and tense. This person's screaming at the top of her lungs. And all of a sudden, you see some human life form shooting out of her body. So what would you think? You would think that woman's dying, and you would think that thing that's coming out of her is dying. And everyone is there trying to manage the situation. And really what's happening, she's giving birth. So from all these different mashalim and all these different examples, it's to come to teach you our problems are not a problem. Our feeling helpless is not the issue. It's that we don't turn it into prayer. It's that we don't give it back up to Hashem. This is all we need to do. It's all we can do. That's called bitul. That's called self-nullification. (laughs) <laughs> and this is the highest mila, and this is what gives birth to new realities. This is the seed that grows. So whether you're feeling great and you're excited to go do it, to do it, or you're like me every day, and you're struggling and you don't know how you're going to make it through the day, and your mom is just holding on, and you get to your car or you get to the room or you get outside and you scream to Hashem, that's good also. The problem is we forgot how to fight. Rabbeinu is coming to teach us how to fight. Emuna is not some vague belief in God. Emuna, Rabbi Nachman says, is tefillah. Emuna is tefillah. It is prayer. So if a person says to themselves, oh, what are you talking about? I have Emuna. I believe in Hashem. But are you praying? If your Emuna is not turning into prayer, it's not Emuna. It's something, but it's not Emuna. Amuna means to pray. How do you get that type of amuna? How do you get to the point that you can mamish go and scream out to Hashem and believe that something's going to come out of it? It says that Mordechai raised Esther. That word raised is coming from the root word which means amuna, amen. He raised her. According to Kabbalah, Mordechai represents the tzaddik. He represents the esod represents like Rabbeinu for us. And Esther is the Jew who's concealed. Even she doesn't know. She's hidden, even from herself. She's a spark of godliness inside of her. She has an amuna inside of her that's roaring, that's deep. She's a Jew. It's so, 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 so deep for her. In fact, she's going to bring the geula. But how does she ever get to the point that she can live with that faith, that she could even go back to Mordechai and say, we have to go pray now. Because Mordechai raised her. And even though it says that Mordechai was her uncle, we know that according to Chazal, they were married. So a person might say, well, I'm not married to Rabbeinu. So Rabbi Nachman says, well, that's a mistake. He says you should have two loves in your life. You should love your wife, and you should love the tzaddik. But you should love the tzaddik more. He said that. I didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it. It stays between us. It stays between us. Mm-hmm. And when we post this on YouTube to everybody else in the world who wants to say it. <laughs> you have to let the Rebbe raise you. How do you let the Rebbe raise you? We got to follow Rav Natan. What did Rav Natan do? Rav Natan was a genius. He was Bucky and Shas when he met Rabbeinu. Rabbi Nachman spoke about him, how he was so smart that he could see a building and he could know the dimensions just by looking at it for one moment, and yet 
He didn't think anything of himself. And as a result of that, despite the fact that Rabbi Nachman had students that were tzaddikim, that were talmudei chachamim, that were mekubalim, none of them got what Rav Natan got. And I don't even mean like there's like a little bit of a difference. Rabbi Nachman said none of his students understood him at all except for Rav Natan. So what is it that Rav Natan did that was so special? He wasn't the smartest. He wasn't the best looking. He wasn't the most anything. So why did he get the Rebbe? How did the Rebbe raise him? Because Rav Natan said, I know a little bit, but Rebbe Nachman knows everything. What is a little bit in the face of everything? It's nothing. So what's the best thing that I could do right now? I'm going to take everything I know and put it to the side. That's called the seed dying. And you know what happens from that place? He starts to fill you up with his seed. Right? You're in union, you're married. He gives you hipotidut, he gives you chatzot, he gives you fighting for joy, doing whatever it takes to be happy all the time. And you know what's going to happen? With each and every eight that he gives you, you'll be like, yeah, this isn't going to help. And then you try and you're like, oh my gosh, this really helps. And you'll be like, yeah, but that thing's a little bit crazy. And try and you're like, oh my gosh, this helps also. This really works. And then with each thing, you're like, oh my gosh, is everything he does works? It really works? Like everything he says is like, I could take this to the bank and cash this thing. This thing is going to work. Yeah, everything's like that. You have uh, thousands and thousands of people who are going to Uman from all different backgrounds, from all different... I mean, look at me. I was an atheist my whole life. I wasn't even like, you know, like Rebbe Akiva that he wanted to bite the, the <coughs> legs of all the whatever. I was mamash in college and I was trying to go to religious people that I could find and convince them that God doesn't exist. I'm doing a lot of tshuva on this. Okay. I'm not a person who grew up religious. You know how hard it is for me to believe in the things that I'm saying? You know how much I've had to fight for these things? You know how many thousands of hours at this point I've had to do a nipo to do? How many times I've been pushed against the wall and a mamash feel like breaking and I have nothing else to do and I just throw myself on the Rebbe and say... Listen, the Torah says, find the Rebbe, and then don't move to the right or left of what he's saying. Sometimes people will say to me, but what Rebbe Nachman is saying, I can't do that right now, that's crazy to do. I'm like, listen, do what he says, and on the side that, let's say, it's wrong. Chas v'halila, but let's say it's not really the right Eitzah for you. So you know what you could say to Hashem at the end of your life? You told me to listen to my rabbi, my rabbi told me to do this. That's it. I'm not smarter than my rabbi. What else am I going to do? I'm doing what you asked me to do. I'll tell a story that uh, I think maybe a couple of you know. So I'll tell you again because I know you guys love hearing the same story over and over again. I remember there was a kid in Queens. He was actually blind. He gave me a lot of chizik, actually. He was a teenager. He was with Bukharians in Queens. And he had a, a walking stick and he couldn't see. And he loved Torah. So he was always at Shior and listening to Torah. His mom was always bringing him to different classes and he was always asking people for rides to get to these things and everyone was helping him get there. He loved Torah so much, he was the only one who came to every one of my classes. So unfortunately for him, he had to hear the same stories all over and over and over again. <laughs> I used to always tell the story about how I met my wife because, you know, it's a pretty miraculous story. And he'd be like, oh my gosh, again? You're going to tell this story again? I can't take this story again. And then he starts repeating like word for word the whole thing. I'm like, okay, I guess I got to figure out like a new story to tell. So anyway, sorry. But um, here's an example for me in my life. So a couple of years ago, I got to Israel. And I'm so excited. I made it to Eretz Yisrael, the 20th tour of the Quran. Rabbi Nachman says, if you get to the land, you can mamish call yourself an Ish Melchama. Say, I'm a man of war. You can say it and mean that. Like, oh my gosh, I made it here. I did it. I had the worst conversation I've ever had in my life with my parents. I still haven't gotten over it. They still haven't gotten over it, but I'm here. We're doing this thing. Okay, great. So now, Rosh Hashanah is coming up soon. And now I'm not 13 hours away. I'm a few hours away. It's a little bit easier of a thing to talk to my wife about now, right? Please, three hours away. I'll get there and I'll get back. It's like nothing. Okay, great. I buy my tickets. And not only that, I had spent two years mechazeking these guys in Queens to come with me. But then COVID started, so then it didn't happen. They all got tickets. I bought my ticket. I'm ready to go. And then all of a sudden, my wife texts me and she says to me, David, do you have a, a, like the documents you need to go there? Like, do you have a passport from Israel? I said, 
I said, no, but I have the American passport. They're like, she's like, I don't know if that's enough to go. And I was like, what are you talking about? And then like, after I said that, I'm like, oh my gosh, is she right? And I texted somebody and asked them who would know. And he said, yeah, of course you need that. So I started to have a little bit of a mental breakdown. And, uh, and then, you know, I don't know how all the government systems work here. But, uh, you know, in America, everything's like chick chock. You know, you make an appointment. They have a million options. You can go tomorrow. Here, it's like, okay, a year and a half, two years, maybe. <laughs> oh, when you get there, they're going to ask for a document they didn't tell you about. And then, oh, sorry, I'm just like l- letting go of all my stuff right now. Okay, but anyway, so I, I, I speak to my wife about it. She goes, listen, there's no appointment for months. Just go and, and tell them the situation and hopefully they'll help you. So I'm going over there, and I don't know what I'm in for, but I see this guy over there, it's this Israeli guy, and I start to explain to him, you know, listen, I don't have an appointment, but um, I'm, I have to go to Uman, it's very, very important. Um, I didn't know I need this document, I have no way to get it now, please, can you help me, da, da, da. And then I realized he doesn't speak any English, <laughs> so he didn't understand it. And he told me, appointment, do you have an appointment? I said, no. So he said, so get out of here. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. This is like, this is life or death for me. I actually have to go. It's very, very important. There's no way for me to make an appointment by the time I got here. I literally just got here. So I'm, I'm stuck in the, whatever. All these people around me see how intense I am about the conversation, how serious it is for me. So they start to translate for me. They're like advocating for me to this guy. And the guy's listening to all of them. And he said, does he have an appointment? And he said, no. Okay, so leave. Get out of here. What are you doing here? So... I try, I try, I try, and I'm finally walking away. As I'm walking away, it hits me. I'm not going to go to Uman. And I went to my car, and you know, like, when you're invested in this, and this is your whole life, and you're talking about it every day, and you're doing it every day, and you really believe in it, and you can't go to Uman, oh, it hurts. I'm sitting in my car, and I just start crying like a baby sitting there thinking about, oh my gosh, all my guys from Queens are going for the first time. I'm not going to be able to go. After two years of not going, I haven't seen my ready. I can't, I can't. It was like a little bit of a death. Part of me died. But then something sprouted out of me. I start screaming to Hashem, just out of nowhere, pitom. I fight for you every day. I fight for the Rebbe every day. I'm not perfect, I make a million mistakes, I have so many lackings, I can't count all of them. But I haven't given up yet, and I fight for you every single day, I need you to fight for me. And that's getting louder, and I'm screaming it, fight for me, fight for me. And tears are coming from my eyes, and I'm screaming, fight for me, at the top of my lungs. And all of a sudden, I get a call from my wife. She said, David, did you leave the place yet? I said, no, they're not letting me in. She said, don't leave, I just spoke to my dad about everything told me he knows the guy who runs the entire office over there and he said don't leave he's trying to get you in now I just want to explain who my wife's father is okay my wife's Yemenite her dad lives in a Moshav next to the airport if you're going to look at the list of who are the most connected influential people in the land of Israel you wouldn't put him high on that list okay for him to know the head of anything outside of that Moshav is a very unlikely situation (coughs) And I'm sitting there and I have no idea what's going on. I'm so emotional because I was just screaming for like the past 10 minutes. And I'm sitting there, like not knowing what to do. And all of a sudden she texts me, she said, David, go back in and tell her you want to see this person. And I'm like so, like, I have so much adrenaline right now. I don't know what's going on. I'm walking in the place. I tell the guy, can you let me in? He said, appointment, you have an appointment? I said, no, but I need to see this person. And his face like went pale. (laughs) And he goes, one second. And he goes to the back and says, come in. I come in. All of a sudden, there's all these people there waiting. They all go before me. Everyone leaves. I'm the only one left. And they finally call me up. I'm like shaking at this point. (laughs) I go up there. And they say, what do you need? And I tell them, I really need to go to Uman. What dates do you need to be there? I explain the dates that I need to be there. I said, okay, give me one second. Within 30 seconds, it gives me a special, unique travel document that's not a passport that allows you to go on those exact dates that you need to go and come back on those exact dates that you need to come back 
and it lasts for a year. And I went to Uman for Rosh And when I got to the Tzion, can you imagine how I cried? And I'm saying to the Rebbe, I fight for you, you fight for me. And I'm sitting there with him. What is that? That's Mordechai raising Esther. That's the tzaddik. That's me being vulnerable enough to say, I don't know. And I'm connected to a person who does know. And even though I'm not holding in the place of believing what he believes, I can believe in the Rebbe. That he does know. I can live with that. And I can count on that. I'll finish with this story that I heard from a Weinberger. I forget the Rebbe's name, so please forgive me, but it's connected to this whole story. And I hope this just kind of brings the whole idea home. And Bezod Hashem, we will spend our time wisely when we go back. Not trying to go online, on Facebook, and trying to influence other people to spread awareness of whatever. Don't be busy with all this stuff. There's one thing that works. There's the only thing that works. If you look in the Torah, there's only one thing that ever saved us from anything. It's prayer. If you go back to us leaving Mitzrayim, it was we screamed out to Hashem. If it was us leaving Persia, it's because we got together for three days and we prayed to Hashem. What is Mashiach going to do? Rabbi Nachman says he's going to teach us how to pray. There's no special anecdote. There's no special code. There's no cheat code. There's no special meditation. There's no higher level of consciousness. There's one thing that we can all do is pray. Think about it. What's the one thing that everybody can do? Everyone can pray. What's the one thing everybody can do? Everyone can be alone with Hashem. Everyone can do that. This is what we need to do. Yeah. Weinberger told a story about this Rebbe. Again, he was in the show. This Rebbe became very close with a secular Jew who was in the camp with him. The secular Jew didn't know he was a Rebbe and didn't care. And he called him by his last name. I'm just going to make up a name right now. I'll say Schwartz. Okay, Schwartz. Kept calling the Rebbe Schwartz. Hey, Schwartz. No, how's it going to go today? We're going to live. We're going to make it to tomorrow. What do you think, Schwartz? Schwartz is very humble. He's a tzaddik. So he says, I don't know. Hopefully, you know, Bezrat Hashem, it's going to be good. One night, after being there for a long time, and they got very close during this time period, all of a sudden, the Germans came in the middle of the night and woke them up and said, come, we have an activity we need to do. Everyone gathered together. They all come outside, brings them to the side, says, okay, we're going to dig a ditch right here. It's very important. So you don't ask any questions. You start digging, digging, digging. They dig a very, very big ditch. We'll call it an Olympic-sized ditch, okay? All of a sudden, the Germans say, okay, now we're going to play a game. Whoever can jump from one side to the other side will survive. Whoever can't make it from one side to the other side or doesn't jump, this is going to be the last moment of his life. Even an Olympian jumper would not be able to jump from one end of this ditch to the other side of this ditch. And this guy who was friends with Schwartz had some chutzpah. And he said, I'm not giving them the pleasure of killing me in this game. I'm not jumping. They can just kill me. And the Rebbe looked at him very seriously. And he said, listen to me. When the Nazis scream, jump, I want you to close your eyes and jump as high as you possibly can. And he saw him in a different way. And he said, okay. All of a sudden, the Nazis scream, jump. He closes his eyes. He jumps as high as he can. He opens his eyes. And he's on the other side with the Rebbe. And you look back down, and you see all of the bodies of all these Jewish people in that ditch. They're the only two on the other side. He says to the Rebbe, how did you do that? He said, me? That's not a question. I hang on to the coattails of my ancestors. You, that's Akasha. How did you make it? He said, that's also not a question. I held on to you. We're not the Rebbe, and that's okay. And we may not believe in Hashem like Rebbe Nachman does. It's also okay. 
but we can hold on to the Rebbe. And whatever is going on in your life, and whatever is going on right now in the world, <coughs> even if Nazis, Arabs, terrorists are saying jump, okay, hold on to the Rebbe and jump as high as you possibly can. I got out of my hippo to do it a couple days ago, and I said, Hashem, what do you want from me? Tell me what you want from me. I don't know what to do. Right now. I turn on the radio, and all of a sudden I hear a song. The song happens to be something that Rabbi Nachman said. You guys all became Sadiqim. Very nice. That's not really what I intended. I was really hoping you'd be like wild animals roaring in the forest. This became a song. That was the song that was on the radio. No, it was another version. Sure, nothing I, I never heard. I don't know what it was. It was like, what are the chances of this? I'm turning on the radio. It's an Israeli radio station. It's not like a Uman Uman, you know, a radio station. It's like a normal mainstream radio station. And they're playing this song. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, okay. We don't have to be tzaddikim. Just try. But we could all scream to Hashem. Hashem, we're going to take that with us. And you should know, yes, they're soldiers, they're in the front lines, and we should support them in every way that we can. But we're also soldiers. Yisrael means that we fight with the divine and we win. That's what it means to be a Jew. And we have the Tsar of Esav right now who's hovering over us and he's telling you, you're done. Okay, so we hold on to the Tzaddik and we flip him. And we say, not until you bless me first. Because there's no way I'm going through all of this and it's for no reason. There's got to be something amazing that's going to come from this. There's got to be something messianic that comes from this. There has to be something ge'ur that, that comes from this. Something needs to give birth right now. That's our muna. That's our faith. And that comes from screaming to Hashem. We should all be able to do that together and to see the coming of Mashiach be'emet soon in our days and be under the Rosh Hashanah like Rabbi Nachman says and get to see that b'schut our muna. We had Geula, and we were a big part of with Hashem, bringing that to the whole world. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen.